I want to really, in my subject matter over the next few days, is to ask the question about people prepared. We'll come later as to where that quote comes from. But for now, we need to ask ourselves a very important questions, a series of questions, I think. Before the coming of the Lord, there are things that we need to put in place in terms of preparing ourselves, our lives, our minds, our habits, how we see things and what we do. There is a time, a opportunity to make ourselves ready, whatever that readiness might be. Suffice to say, we know that the Lord is near. We see the challenges right around the world, political and social unrest, unprecedented in the history of the world. And so as a people call out to serve God, it's important, isn't it, to look at the scriptures and to see these lessons that were laid out so long ago, because these things were written for our learning that through comfort and patience of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so for a few moments over the next few days, we're going to consider that phrase to make ready a people prepared. So then let's go back then in our Bibles to the book of Genesis and chapter 50. You will know that Moses, that Joseph and his brethren dwelt in Egypt, of course. And you will know that they were there for a considerable amount of time and they were made into a great nation. And we will understand that in these verses in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is about to die. He is now 110 years old. He is about to die, and there is specific reason here through his death that he asks his brethren to remember something absolutely important, that one day God would visit his people and they, they would leave Egypt. Genesis chapter 50, and we're going in at verse 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware unto Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Now you will remember the background history to the life of Joseph. By the time Joseph dies, brothers and sisters and friends and young people, it's fair to say that Egypt was a world empire by way of wealth. Because of Joseph, Egypt was now a superpower. They had wealth untold. In fact, I go as far as to say that Joseph and his brethren, perhaps they would have been counted as maybe millionaires. Well, when you look at the record carefully, you see the absolute wealth, the absolute riches that Joseph had allowed Pharaoh and the Egyptians to acquire. They had the best of the land. It's quite interesting to bear in mind, too, if I was to ask you the question, what are the last five words in the book of Genesis? Without looking, don't cheat. What are the last five words in the book of Genesis? The last five words in Genesis chapter 50. In a coffin. In Egypt. And I asked myself the question, why does it end like that? In a coffin in Egypt. Well, let's stand back and look at the bigger picture. Genesis, the book of Genesis means the book of the beginnings, the book of life, the book of hope, the book of the beginnings. And Genesis chapter one begins 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved or hovered or fluttered over the face of the waters and so on and so forth. It begins with life. That's the point, isn't it? Genesis. It begins with life. But it ends in death. In a coffin. In Egypt. Why is that? Now, you have heard me say this perhaps on more than one occasion. I make no apologies for saying it again. If you've heard me say it for the first time, please make a note. Oh, that reminds me. I hope that there is good note making because we quickly forget. Genesis chapter 1. The book of life. Genesis chapter 50, it ends in death, in a coffin, in Egypt. Exodus, what does the word Exodus mean? Movement. So what bridges Genesis and Exodus is a resurrection, isn't it? In a coffin in Egypt. It is pointing forward, brothers and sisters and young people, to a resurrection of hope. Thou shalt carry my bones. Exodus movement. That's what the word Exodus means. So it ends in death, and Exodus is movement. It's rather like Ezekiel 38, isn't it? Can these bones live? Thou knowest, O Lord. Ezekiel 38. The resurrection of God's people. And so it seems to me, brothers and sisters, that what God is showing in the book of Exodus is him once again creating life. That they might move out of bondage, of sin, of death. Moving from that state of death into life. Now you see, the lesson is no different for us, is it? Really, brothers and sisters. We need to be constantly reminded that we are moving, have moved, as it were, from death to life. That there might be a movement in our lives. Not a political movement, not a social movement with all its isms, what? but that movement to recognize our failings, our shortcomings, and recognize that we have no continuing city, but we move forward toward the kingdom. And so in Exodus chapter 1, here then is another sort of beginning. It is really the book of the beginning of how God resurrects his people. Exodus chapter 1, notice how things change. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Remember those 70 souls into Egypt? And by the time they left, sent centuries later, there was nigh on two, maybe even three million of them. Verse eight, verse seven, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? It's language again of Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply it and replenish the earth. It's reminding us to read with care. It's inviting us, brothers and sisters, to look at the principles of Genesis and compare them now with a different sort of creation. A movement toward God. Moving from death to life. That's what Egypt was all about. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king 
over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Oh, things change. Politicians come and go. Circumstances change. One year there might be peace. And the next year there might be civil unrest. The likes of which we have never seen before. And so the challenges that we see, Brem sisters, in the 21st century, they are lessons which we can see in the very pages of scripture because these things were written aforetime for our learning. So let's see what else we can glean as we read with care. And he said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there fall out any war, they join also unto our enemies. And so now, there is persecution and affliction for God's people. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. The Jews, the Hebrews in Egypt at that time had the best of everything because of the work of Joseph and the blessings of God. But you see how things change. Verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. The Hebrew there word, there is the word perek. It means severity, cruelty. To break apart with rigor. And they made their lives bitter. Hebrew word mara. It means grief. Grief, cruelty, severity, breaking apart, and hard bondage. Cruel bondage, the word there is. in the manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Now it's important to bear in mind, this is a God. How then do we understand this concept of a people being prepared? Will God prepare us for the kingdom through consummate ease? Through providing everything that is comfortable for us in our lives? Those are the questions we can ask. It seems to me, brothers and sisters and young people, that in these verses, there was a certain degree of hardship that God saw fit, that God saw right to cause that hardship in the land of Egypt. And why was that? Now, what I want to say next, brothers and sisters, I want us to really hold in our minds. Because it seems to me, one of the reasons why God caused it to be so difficult in the land of Egypt at this time was to get them to understand that they had no part in Egypt. That they wanted and they must learn to yearn for the kingdom to understand that they must leave. And they had no part to play in that land. Genesis chapter, Exodus chapter 3. When God now appears to Moses. So let's just maybe bring our thoughts together. In terms of this first slide. I hope everybody can see that. Can I have a confirmation please? Brother. Yes, brother. Excellent. Thank you. It's interesting, isn't it? Whenever we see scenes or pictures of Egypt, 
Have you noticed? You can see that picture and in your mind, it, you, you know it's Egypt. That's interesting, isn't it? It comes back to our earlier point. It's as if Egypt was a place of death. Why the very symbol of the pyramids in Egypt, graves in Egypt, it was a place of death, wasn't it? We know, no matter how many years to come, we know when we see a, a, a picture of the, Egypt, of, of the pyramids, it represents death. The kings were buried there. And so we're going to be looking at in signs and in wonders and in God's judgments being poured out. God's people. In the land of Egypt. They dwelt in Goshen. Now that rich, fertile plain there. That's where the river Nile was. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows and I'm come down to deliver. Notice those phrases, verse 7, I've seen, I've heard, I know, I'm going to come down and act. Have you ever asked yourself the question about verse 2? When God reveals himself to Moses, why this way? Through a bush? Verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burnt with fire and the bush was not consumed. Have a think about that. Out of the millions of ways God could have shown Moses anything to show Moses his might and his power. Why this symbol? The bush with the leaves and the flames engulfing the leaves in the bush. But there is no carbonization. It's not being burnt. There is no soot. Nothing is being burnt. It's in the flames. What is the lesson here, brothers and sisters? Remember, we, 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 we must always say we must ask questions of the text. So we can understand, we must use those interrogatory pronouns. Which, what, where, who, why, when, how. If we don't ask those questions, we won't understand. Why this symbolism? Why does God go to great lengths? So the flames are being there. The bush is being engulfed by the flames, but it's not perishing. Why? Well, I'm going to suggest that God is saying to Moses, my people are in Egypt. They are in the flames of affliction. But I will preserve them. Oh, you think I might be stretching the point? We haven't got time. Make a note of it. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Remember? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are inside the, the, the burning furnace. And then there, there's the angel inside. The king says, did we not, did we not th throw th three men in there? And I see four men, one like unto the son of, son of God. It's an angel, you see. They're inside the flames, not perishing. God was in control. And when they come out, it says not even a hair was singed. Neither was the smell of smoke on them. God was in control. Now make a note of this reference, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. You might like to go there very quickly so you know that that verse is there. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. Notice how it describes Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. And the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt. So 
the point is that even God describes Egypt as a furnace, an iron furnace, taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace. Egypt was like an iron furnace, a furnace of affliction. And God is saying to Moses, I know exactly what I am doing. And this bush represents my power. And this bush represents my people. And they will not be extinguished. They will be preserved in the womb of Egypt. Now, here is an interesting point, brothers and sisters. God saw fit that his people were being prepared in the midst of trial. That is the essence of it. In the midst of trial, God is preparing us now. In the midst of challenge and temptation, and difficulty, God is preparing you, brother, you, sister, now in the trials so that you will learn that you want no part of this world. Notice that. Verse 7, I have seen, I have heard, I know, I will come down to deliver. Verse 18, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. It's fellowship. In this one chapter, we have the whole spectrum. Tribulation, God seeing, God's plan that he might meet with us. And if you forget everything about what I'm saying today, and I hope you don't, it's about meeting God. Chapter four. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. The Hebrew word there is nakash. A serpent. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. He says, cast it on the ground and became a serpent. Verse four. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. It was an act of faith, wasn't it? Take it by the tail. It might come up and whip round and bite you. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. Why was it then that God would choose this rod, this serpent, to represent his power? That they may believe that the Lord God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. So, the rod to the serpent, but there's another sign. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand onto thy, into thy bosom. And he put forth his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he put it in again and it was whole. Why this example? Keep a marker there and come across to Psalm 74. Psalm 74 is very helpful, I think. Psalm 74 and verse 11. The psalmist is very impatient. Psalm 74, verse 1. Why, Lord, why? He mentioned it twice. Verse 2. Remember, don't forget us, Lord. Act. Lord, act, please. Help us. Have you forgotten us? Psalm 74, verse 11. Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. He, we haven't got time to look at this psalm. The psalmist is saying, Lord, why don't you act? Lord, take your hand out of your bosom. 
act, Lord, do something with your right hand. Lord, we know all about your right hand of power. We mentioned that in, in our discussion, didn't we, in our questioning. Lord, do something, he's saying. Pluck your hand out of your bosom, Lord. P do something. And I think God is saying to Moses, these people, they're like a leprous nation. And we'll come back to that in a minute, why I say that. He's saying, I'm going to act now. Psalm 74, verse 11. Read the whole psalm if you've got time one of these days, if you get a chance. This people is a leprous people. They're sinning in Egypt. Then there's another one. Pour the water out. Verse 9. Upon the dry ground and it shall become blood. So let's think for a few moments about the background of Egypt. When Moses dwelt in Egypt, we are told that the scriptures tell us that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, who was mighty in word and in deed. The Egyptians worshipped gods. They had a god for everything under the sun, including a god for the sun. They worshipped the river Nile. Happy, the god of the spirit of the Nile. And what God is showing throughout the plagues of Egypt is that God will be undermining all the gods of Egypt. The water being turned to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the moraine on cattle, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, the death of the firstborn. Every plague was designed to undermine, to totally destroy all the gods of Egypt and possibly the most important god in the land of Egypt was Happy, the god of the spirit of the Nile. And the water being turned to blood would mean a total annihilation. That river Nile which was the source of all life in Egypt, would be turned to blood. Ra, the sun god, the ninth plague, remember, there was darkness, the destruction. And this now is a, is a famous picture found inside of one of the pyramids in Egypt. At the, the front of it is Ra, the sun god, with the anchor in his right hand, a, a, a sign of life. And it was upon the going down of the sun. Legend had it, and their belief was that the spirits of the dead would be escorted by Ra, the sun god, into the afterlife. And here he is escorting the soul of Queen Nefertari. Now we begin to see that the beliefs of Egypt were geometrically opposed to the truth of the living God. And all that would be wiped away. And here then are the depictions of the various gods. Happy, the god of the Nile. And these are paintings, copies of paintings found inside the pyramids, thousands of years old. Notice the connection in the left hand of Happy. There's a frog. Oh, that's interesting. Happy, the god of the Nile. Ptah, the creator. Amen, father of the gods. Ra, the sun god, Thoth, scribe of the gods. The whole land of Egypt was corrupt, brothers and sisters, and God's people, and notice that, God saw fit. It was right that they dwelt there for the time being in the womb of Egypt, that they might learn 
to come out from Egypt and to appreciate God. That's what they believed. In the afterlife, where the souls would, a man's soul was weighed in the balance against a feather. And if it was found heavier than the feather, well, he would be destroyed forever. And he would not be allowed to go into the afterlife. You see how unscriptural? And we know, brothers and sisters, that there is no immortality of the soul. When we're dead, we're dead. But we have a hope of the resurrection. When the dead in Christ shall rise. Inside Tutankhamun's found pyramid. Notice inside his pyramid. Well, they put, they put his best chariot. You, you see those caskets on the right hand side? Those white caskets? Do you know what they found inside there? For about 3,000 years old. They found food. Well, he's going to need food in the afterlife, isn't he? I jest. Well, of course, he's going to need his best chariot in the afterlife, isn't he? Oh, what says the scripture? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, having food and raiment therewith to be content. Oh, that's the inside of his tomb. He's in the dust of the ground. They believed also in Thoth, the creator. Thoth pouring the water of life. This was what they believed. And I, I, I feel that it seems as if because that was a myth in the days of Moses, a legend in the days of Moses, what the Egyptians believed, it was a man, a figure of a man with a, Ibis's head. Now, I remember spending time, my, what, myself and Sister Allison, uh, in Trinidad, certainly for, for uh, three, three years. And uh, we would go and see the red Ibis. And uh, Anyway, the Ibis head, the god Thoth, pouring the water of life from a vase. Thoth was the god of magic and the creator of speech. Think of that. Now, this is ancient writing. Thoth, the god of magic and the creator of speech. That's interesting, isn't it? Look at Exodus chapter 4. Does God, in a subtle way, bring that to the remembrance of Moses? Verse 9, he would pour out the water because the legend had it that he would pour out the water of life. There it is. Well, look at the scripture. Isn't this illuminating? Verse 9, you shall pour the water out. Verse 10, and Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, margin, in the Hebrew. I am a man of few words. Heretofore to, nor since thou hast unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? I am the creator, Moses. Not what they believe in Egypt. Who hath made man's mouth? And it's as if, brothers and sisters, that these ancient drawings found thousands of years ago Speak loudly to us even now when we look at what the scripture and you will see it, this, this painting found inside the tombs, thousands of years old. He's got a goblet and he's pouring out the water of life. Well, that, that sign is the anchor, the anchor of life that the gods had. There it is. Isn't that interesting? And so what we see then, that's what the Egyptians believed. Oh, it's interesting too. Do you know that the, 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 the Egyptians worshipped Hika? 
the goddess. A woman's body with the head of a frog. And they prayed for fertility because the frog would produce millions of frog spawn. They prayed to this goddess. Look at Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Notice that. We know the plagues come between chapter 7 to chapter 12. But chapter 4 of Exodus, it's as if it's showing us something really important. God says to Moses, say to Pharaoh, if you don't let my son go, I'm going to kill your son, your firstborn. That's what it's building up to, isn't it? Remember the plays again, the water being turned to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the moraine on cattle, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness. And the death of the firstborn is a sort of crescendo. It, it builds to a, to, to a climax of that's what it's all about. That's what it's pointing forward to, isn't it? And that's mentioned in chapter 12 of Exodus. But in chapter 4, it's God saying, this is what it's all about. If you don't let my son go, I'm going to kill your son. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. We won't go there because of time. Make a note of it. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So that's how God describes his precious son. I called him out of Egypt. Precious son, I hear you say. Why then did he allow his precious son to experience rigor, bondage, cruelty, vexation, slavery? And all those horrific things in Egypt, my precious son, well, yes. That they might learn and understand that man doth not live by bread alone. For God would humble them and prove them to know what within their heart, whether they would keep his commandments or not. We live, brothers and sisters, in the age of rage. There is road rage. Air rage. And if you go shopping, there is trolley rage. And these things that we see around us, brothers and sisters. Social injustice. Tyranny. All the isms we can ever think about. And these things should cause us to yearn, to want the kingdom more. Not to get involved in the protest of the age. To stand apart from it. And be separate from it. For it is so designed to compel us that we want the kingdom more than ever before. Come across, please, to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11. We might recall that when God's people left Egypt, we might think for a few moments and forget that it wasn't only God's people that left. Numbers 11 and verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lasting. And the children of Israel also wept among us and said, We remember the flesh pots in Egypt, the leeks and the onions and the garlics and the melons and the cucumbers, all the things that we, eat, we ate. And you know, they found this in scripture actually, in one of these pyramids in Egypt, all these things that were consumed on the job. And so it's important to remember. A mixed, the mixed multitude, not only the Hebrews left Egypt, but also 
a mixed multitude, Egyptians and maybe other people as well. Exodus, please, in chapter six. Then the Lord said unto Moses, now shalt thou see what I will do unto Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. From verses 1 down to verse 8, you have the word I no less than 18 times. I am. I appear. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Verse 6, I will bring you out. Verse 6, I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you. Verse 6, verse 7, I will take you. I will bring you. I will rid you. I will redeem you. I will take you to me for a people. That's what it's all about. God wanting his people to get nearer and nearer to him. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Around 200 years had gone by, brothers and sisters. We, we, we won't dwell on that time period. That's for another time. From the death of Joseph, now up until now, it was now the Savior had come. Moses, now he had come. Now he had come. And I find, brothers and sisters, do you know verse 9, possibly the most saddest verse in the whole of Exodus? Now it was time. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. What a lesson, brothers and sisters. Now the promise was here that they would leave. Joseph had said it. So now the opportunity was here, but the people hearken not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. What had happened? Maybe now they were too busy looking down at their plight, the trials, the temptations, the challenges of life, instead of looking up. They were too busy looking down. Just like the things that they remembered in Egypt. Remember all those things that came from the ground. We remember the leeks and the onions and the garlics and the melons and the cucumbers and the flesh pots. We remember all those things. They were looking down at the things of God, down at the things of the world, instead of looking up for the grapes and the figs. Maybe they had forgotten over that couple of centuries period. What had they forgotten? Malachi tells us that they that spake often one to another. God remembered them. A book of remembrance. Maybe that's the lesson, brothers and sisters. Maybe we're not reading enough. Maybe we're not praying enough. Maybe we're not doing those things enough. We need to be ready. Exodus chapter 7. And the Lord God said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of Egypt. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart with, and multiply my signs and my wonders. Signs? Wonders? I'm going to show you my signs and my wonders. The Hebrew word oath, it means signal, monument, evidence. I'm going to show you my evidence. Wonders? The Hebrew word is mofath. It means in the sense of conspicuousness, a display of power, an open display. 
of my power, of my might to bring you out so that, remember our title, so that you as a people will be prepared. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine enemies and my people, my armies and my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Notice that, signs, wonders, judgments. Hebrew word shefet, it means to inflict pain. Notice that three-fold principle. Signs, I'm going to show you evidence. Wonders, I'm going to openly display my power. Judgments, I'm going to inflict pain. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's important too, isn't it? That the Egyptians shall know. Verse 10, and Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. As I said, out of all the things to represent God's power, why a serpent? Now, did you know that this word serpent in verse 10 is different to the serpent mentioned earlier on when Moses cast it down and it became a serpent? This word is the word tanin. It means dragon, monster. It comes 28 times in scripture and it's translated 21 times dragon three times serpent, three times whale, one time sea monster. Why am I telling you this? The serpent that is mentioned when Moses first casts it down in the wilderness, and the serpent here is a different word. This serpent is an absolute monster of a thing. You see the point? Oh, you don't believe me? Look, compare the two words in your spare time. It's saying God is well able, well able to show his might, irrespective of the, the so-called foolishness of the trickery of Pharaoh's servants. Oh, but there is something else. God's Serpent swallows up all the other Egyptian serpents. Why is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. Very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We know the reference well. Just so you know, it is there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Why, this is a wonderful subject. To illustrate 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54. You're there already. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 25, which is another story in itself. So it was to represent God swallowing up in victory. Egypt and all it represented. Oh, but there is something else. It is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going in. At verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ there be ye reconciled to God. For we have made him. To be sin for us. Who knew no sin. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's as if that serpent representing of sin, that serpent through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul tells us, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin and by that agent would reconcile us, swallowing up death in total victory. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to bring our thoughts together as we consider our, our second subject later. Exodus, please, chapter seven, my final reference. Verse five, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt. They shall know, they shall know, they shall know. So brothers and sisters, what is the lesson for us in our opening remarks? We have considered God's people and how God saw fit that they grew and developed and learned and learned to trust in God in you. That might sound a little unsavory for us, but God saw fit for them to experience the rigor, the hatred, the abuse, the horrors in Egypt. I wonder if we would have done it differently. God's people had to learn that there must be something better. They had to learn, brothers and sisters, that they must stand apart from these things and simply trust in God. In God's time, God's ways. God is right. God will always be right. What we must do on our part is to remember that God is preparing us in different ways. He's showing us that we are not of this world. He's teaching us to have patience and to trust in him. He's reminding us that we must not be as God's people. That when, after the death of Joseph, he says, thou shalt carry him hence. Perhaps for a time they had forgotten. And the people hearken not unto Moses. For anguish of spirits and for cruel bondage. If it is that for a moment we are experiencing anguish of spirit, cruel bondage, let us trust and read and pray and remind ourselves that God is in control. Amen.